My name is Tyler Jagan, and uh, I'm pastor of spiritual growth, and last week we started a series all on growth called When I Grow Up, and the idea of this, this series is to kind of really think through this, this thing that we all have that's been implanted within us from the very get-go of our lives, that when we come into this world, we have something inside of us that looks towards somebody else, and, and, and we think, I want to be like them. So even when we were really young, uh, we put on our parents' clothes and we, just, we put them on because we want to be like our dad, right? We want to be like our mom. And then we, we grow up and we start meeting people and, or we hear a lecture or we see somebody on TV and we think, when I grow up, I want to be like them. I, I want to be an astronaut. When I grow up, I want to be like that person who is a doctor. And so we started this series of just kind of answering this, this deep question of, who am I supposed to be when I grow up? And the reality is, is that God implanted this within us because his desire for all of us, all of us all in this room and all of us around the world is for us, ultimately, when we grow up, to become like Jesus Christ. Now, that seems kind of weird, you know, for some of us. You know, if somebody came to you and said to you, so what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, when I grow up, I want to be like Jesus. And people are going to look at you like, oh, that's kind of weird. It's kind of, so we don't really tend to think in terms like that. But the reality is, it's exactly who God desires for us to become when we grow up. To become like Jesus. Now, we talked about last week kind of the, the myths of that. Sometimes in our head, we have it in our mind that to grow up, to become like Jesus means, what is it? Does that mean I have to like grow some hair and a beard and wear, so, wear a robe and wear some sandals? And so I guess for those of us who can't grow here, I guess we can't become like Jesus, right? You know, and then we think, well, what does that mean for our careers? Does that mean I don't become this or I don't become that? I don't become an, an engineer. I don't become a, an inventor. No, that's not, that's not what God is, is getting at at all. It's not about vocation. It's about who we were meant to become as far as our humanity, as a human being. The word mature comes from the Greek word teleos, which means to become full, means to be complete. It is to become the person that we've always wanted to be inside of us. There's a sense of a desire to be full. There's a sense of desire to be complete as a human being, not just vocationally, but as a human. And that, that, that underlining desire that's within us really can only ultimately be fulfilled through, through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And ultimately what we're going to talk about today, a learning relationship with Jesus Christ. And so one of the aspects that we're going to look at is about Jesus and what it means to look like Jesus is, is to think like Jesus. Because what God desi desires for us to, to do and to become is people, when we grow up, is to think like Christ. Now this is very important for us to, to grapple. See, when we grow up, especially in the church world, I'm guilty of this, I've seen people struggle over this when it comes to their own spiritual growth. We tend to believe that growing spiritually means I become a Bible scholar, that I memorize scripture, that I know dates and places, and I know maps and where things happened, and, and all of these things. Those pl things have, um, there's a place in that for our spiritual growth. But here's the thing, they do not cause our spiritual growth, all right? I know that. I've, I've done that. I've memorized many scriptures. I have known, learned a lot about scripture, and, uh, but I still find in many areas of my life where I'm just really immature, that there's places in my life where I'm not complete. And some of you guys, you've known some other people too, where uh, they, they know the Bible inside and out. They can quote things all over the place. They know when happened, when stuff happened and all that. And you look at them and you go, how is it that they know all that stuff? But they're really immature in that way. Well, see, what God wants us to do, though, is wants us not just to learn knowledge, but to begin to think the thoughts of Christ to be able to think the way that he thinks, the, things, the way that he thinks about his father, the way that he thinks about life and purpose and meaning, the way he thinks about the fallen nature of humanity and relationships and all of those things, God desires for us to think the thoughts of Christ. Why? Because here's the deal. There isn't anybody who's ever lived on this planet who has been more mature, complete, 
full than Jesus Christ. He was emotionally healthy. He was mentally healthy. He was relationally healthy. And yes, he was spiritually healthy. And Jesus went through more junk than any of us in in this room. He was rejected by his closest friends. He dealt with injustice of a guy who was just going to bring blessing upon the world, but they didn't get him, they didn't understand him, they felt threatened by him, by by which they had him killed in an uh, illegal manner, dealing with injustice. And he dealt with pain and suffering and, um, and, and ultimately a death dying at a young age. But through all of that, Even though he was dealing with injustice and being rejected by people, he was emotionally healthy. He was relationally healthy through all of that. He didn't get mad. He didn't get bitter. He didn't get jealous. He just continued to love those who did those things to him. It's mind-boggling. He was an emotionally, relationally, and spiritually healthy individual because at the end of the day, he trusted his father through all of that. Leaning on him and trusting in him and what, what meaning and purpose and significance all means and what God desires him to accomplish. And then obviously, three, you know, 2,000 years later, we're still talking about him. Sometimes we think about Jesus and we think about him being just archaic and all that, and that's some religious figure and all that. But the more that we learn from him and the more that we begin to understand him, the more we begin to understand what does it mean to be spiritually healthy and emotionally healthy and relationally healthy, and all of those things by which we grow up to maturity, being complete and full. So if God desires for us to grow up to think like Jesus, what does that mean, and how does that look like, and how does God help us to grow to think like Christ? If it's more than just a Bible study, what is it that maybe we're missing by which we don't feel and experience the fullness of life that God designed and desires for us through learning and through learning from him? We're going to open up scripture. We're going to look at a little passage. Actually, it was a letter that was written by a guy named Paul to a group of Christians who from this town called Colossae. And in this, you're going to begin to see how God begins to mold and shape us and help us to grow in maturity in the way that we think about God and think about life and think about meaning and purpose and and all of those things. So if you have your Bible, why don't you flip over to Colossians chapter 2. And as you're flipping over there, we'll have those up on the back there, so don't worry about it. I just want you to kind of think about why we go back to this. It's like, isn't this just some archaic old documents What is something 2,000 years old, what does it have to say to our progressive, fast-moving culture today? Actually, I think when you, you give it a shot and you give it a chance, what you will find is timeless truths that were true 2,000 years ago, that were true 100 years ago, that are true today and will be true forever. Truths that actually we can anchor our lives in by which we can go through this world with joy and peace and fullness and completeness. A Roman philosopher once said this, to know nothing about uh, what happened before you were born is forever to remain as a child. And I think sometimes we, we remain as, as children, spiritually and emotionally and all of those things because we forget or we refuse to learn from the one who has gone before us, who gives us that vision of what it means to be mature, and that is Jesus Christ. So as we dive into here in this letter that Paul wrote to these Christians, I want you to feel in the sense of passion that he has for the people that he's writing to, that I have no doubt that he would have incredible passion for you and I through all of this. Have you ever experienced something in your life that was so fantastic, so amazing, that when you went to go explain to somebody else, like, this was amazing. Let me tell you, it's so beautiful. It was incredible. This, this conference was inc- amazing. Let me tell you about it. And they just kind of look at you like, yeah, I wasn't really there. I don't really jive with what you're saying. It doesn't really move me or anything like that. You ever done that before? You ever had kids or grandkids where you would just go, man, if they would just know this, that would, of the things that I've experienced in my life, life would go so much better for them. Have you ever agonized over your kids or grandkids over that? 
If you have, then you're going to know exactly the way that Paul feels here with these group of Christians because he's, he's, he's basically saying, if you guys just know this stuff, if you guys really lean into God the way that I'm going to explain to you and how to do that and why to do that, you're going to be so blessed by it. So, let's begin. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. He starts off and he says, I want you to know, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you. Not in the negative sense, but in the positive sense. How much passion I have for you. How much I just think about you and how much I desire for you. That I've agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea. Laodicea was just, a, it was just another church in another town about 10 miles from there. So he's talking about these two groups of Christians here. And he says, I've been agonizing over all of y'all. And not only that, but for many other believers who I have who have never met me personally. And I think about them all the time. I think about humanity and I think about people and I just think and I agonize over them. If God, if they would just sink their teeth into your grace, into your love and who you are and just ultimately just sink you know, their whole lives into you. I agonize. If they would just do that, their lives would be so blessed. Verse two, I want them to know and then here I want them to be and I want them to be encouraged I want them to be encouraged by what I speak to them. I want them to be encouraged by who you are, God, and what you've taught us and, and what you're all about. And, and that through that, they would be knit together. How? By strong ties of love. Man, it would be just if they would get what we're trying to do, why we're trying to do this, and they would just experience this incredible encouragement in their lives and the strong ties of love by which they're just knitted together be amazing. And then he says this, I want them to have complete confidence, not wavering, but strength in this idea that they would have confidence in their life, that they may understand God's mysterious plan. How many of you guys would love to know what God's mysterious plan for you? God, what's your plan for my life? And Paul basically says, I wish people would just know this one simple little thing that would revolutionize their whole life and revolutionize their whole way of thinking about life and thinking about God. Because he said, I wish everybody had this confidently. Not like, uh, I don't know, uh, but confidently. Like, I know what God's plan for me is this. That to confidently understand his mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. That's it. Now, I know sometimes you kind of look at that and go, wait a minute, that's it? That's the plan? That's the plan. I wish everybody confidently would understand that God's mysterious plan for them was Christ himself. It's not a knowledge about Christ. It's not about just behaviorism. It's about Jesus himself. Jesus is the one who gives us fulfillment. It's within the context of that relationship that we have with him that we begin to understand things. We begin to understand what our life is about, what, what the world is about, what God is all about, why we're here, what's he all about. It all finds its epicenter in not just the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ himself. And, he goes on, in him and Jesus himself lie hidden, not some, not a little bit, but all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But here's the caveat that you need to see out throughout all of Scripture, particularly with Jesus' Jesus's movement in the New Testament, that when it comes to knowledge and wisdom and all of that stuff, all of that finds its place, in the true wisdom and the true knowledge, in Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is called the logos. It's a Greek term. It means the word. You know, where we get logic. That everything when it comes to understanding and wisdom finds its place in through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. When you, have you ever been to a class where you've had a professor who would just go back and he would just start writing stuff behind you and all he did was just give you information? And that's it. And you walked away maybe a little bit more confused or you kind of understood it and whatever. But you did your work and, and whatnot. Now, have you ever had a teacher that invested in you personally? that you felt like they cared about you and they loved you tremendously. And you learned fabulous things through that. It's what it means to have a relationship with God and to learn uh, a relationship with Jesus Christ and, have a, and to learn from him. 
It's not just about just X's and O's and theology and things like that. It's about learning relationally with Jesus Christ himself that not only encapsulates our heart, but encapsulates our minds to beautiful and wonderful things if we are willing to learn from him as we do life with him. So it goes on, Paul says, I'm telling you this. This is the reason why I'm telling you this. Because there's going to be people out there that say that's a lousy plan, that's an incomplete plan, there's a better plan. You need to make more money, you need to have a better title, you need to, you need to be your own God, you need to do things your own way and figure out your, yourself. And there's going to be people who are going to come in, there's going to be, they're going to use great marketing, great branding, and all of that sort of stuff to slide you away from me. And guys, I've known people, you know, when I was in seminary, you would just see them. They would fall away from God, and you'd sit there and you wonder, why would, how could somebody go and go on mission trips and things like that? How in the world could people go on mission trips and, or go to seminary and they fall away from Jesus Christ? How is that? Through my own experience in life, it's because oftentimes, sometimes we go and we think that God is just a Bible study lesson. Or we think that the Christian life is just about going and doing and we die and we die on the vine because that's not what makes you complete or full. Only Jesus Christ in a relationship can make you full in that. And so Paul says, I'm saying to these things, I'm agonizing over this stuff for you because I really want you guys to understand this because there's going to be things in life that are going to try to, to twist you, move you away from the thing that gives you the most enjoyment, which is Jesus Christ himself. And so I don't want you to be deceived. For, he says, for though I am far away from you. See, he wrote this letter, gave it to somebody, and they sent it. So Paul's not really there when this letter is received. So he's saying, I'm far away from you, but you have to understand my heart is with you. I'm praying for you. I'm thinking about you. I agonize over you because I really want you to know this. And I rejoice that you are living as you should. And this is important, too. This is kind of a myth that we think that, that life is really about doing exactly what God wants us to do. All right? There's a shadow, there's some truth in that, but it's not the whole truth. The whole idea, what you see through Scripture, is that the way that we do life is we do life with Jesus Christ, okay? That we do all of that we do through a relationship with Him. So you guys are living as you should in communion with the Lord and Savior who gave you eternal life. And so, he says, and I rejoice that you are living as you should and that you're Faith in Christ is strong. Faith, again, when we think about it, when we read those words, faith, belief, and trust, all of that is language that needs to find its, 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 um, its point in a relationship with Jesus Christ. What he's talking about is not blind faith in Jesus Christ. It's talking about a really strong trust that you trust this guy because you know what he's done for you. You can trust a guy who's willing to get in the, you know, shove you out of the way and take the hit of a car as a car is driving by. This guy took the hit for you. He died for you. You can trust him. The more that you begin to open your lives and learn from him, the more that you're going to be able to see this guy really also knows what he's talking about when it comes to what's going on in my life and the emptiness and stress and isolation and depression that's going on in my life, this guy, as I give him the opportunity, really speaks into those things. And so Paul says, you know, I'm, I'm, I want you to be firm in the mystery God has for you, which is Jesus Christ himself, a relationship with him. So that way you don't go, you know, falling away from this. But right now, for now, I'm glad of where you're at. You're in a good spot. You're growing in your strength and trust in him. I just want you to stay there. We see this all the time with Rooted. We see people, every single person who goes through Rooted, it goes through it and their lives are changed. It is most amazing. You've got to go through Rooted if you've never been through Rooted before. But we see people who go through Rooted and all of that is once it's over, after the 10 weeks, they slowly go back to the bad habits of just Bible study and doing. And they forget the, the, the beautiful relationship that they have in Jesus Christ and the community with other people. And it's something that we, it's hard for us to, to keep leaning into that really all that Jesus really wants me to do is to learn from him and to say, okay, let's go. Let's go do life together. I want to learn from you. 
And it's easy for us to go back to the things that, that we think help us to grow but don't, which is just knowledge apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Just doing apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's all about that relationship. It's where we find our strength in him. And that's why I also just encourage any of you guys, if you felt like you went through rooted and you're like, man, that was the most exper- greatest, wonderful experience, but yet right now I just feel like I'm just, I'm not, I feel like I'm stuck again. Go through it this time again. Go through it again. I mean, go through it again and then at the end of it say, this is going to become a lifestyle, a relational lifestyle with you, Jesus Christ. And do that. And you'll see your life grow, change, become complete and full. And so Paul goes on and he says, and now... Just as you accepted Christ Jesus, again, you know, sometimes we just kind of think accepted, maybe you've been in church before, accepted means you're in there, someone gave a message about Jesus, and so you accepted Jesus Christ in your life, and blah, blah, blah. And it feels a lot more mental than anything else. What he's really talking about is accepting. It's like accepting a a human being into your life, a person, a relationship. So just as you accepted Christ Jesus into your very life, as your, what does he call him? Lord. You see, in the first century, when they used the term Lord, they really meant it. You know, we tend to, oh, Lord God, Lord this, Lord that. What do you want? Lord, 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 Lord. And then we just kind of go on our own way. But as their faith and trust in Jesus Christ got stronger, the more they began to realize that not only is he truly Lord, he's a good Lord. He's a good guide to teach me how to think, how to learn, how to understand the things that he wants me to understand. And so he says, as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. I love the word there in the Greek, which we translated here as follow. It actually means walk. So the idea is you got to continually, if you want to continue to strong in your faith and your confidence, knitted in, in love for one another, the way that that happens and continue to grow in your maturity, you have to keep walking. He didn't say run. Sometimes we do that. I've, I've been guilty of that. You get all fired up, go to a conference, and you're ready to run for Christ, and you're running, 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 and then you're like, oh, I need a break. This is way, I'm way too tired. So I stop. I don't even walk. I'm, I'm like, I'm worn out. I'm worn out on this whole thing called prayer. I'm all worn out of this thing called serving. I'm all worn out of this thing called get up early on Sunday morning and go to church. I'm worn out. Whoa. So I stop. Jesus never says, run, 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 run. Go, 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 go. He says, for us to grow, we must do life with him and walk with him. It's a walk with him as he teaches us about life at work, at home, in our community, about eternity, purpose, meaning, significance. It's a walk. It's not a run. It's a walk by which we get to have a nice, beautiful, wonderful stroll in relationship with him as we go through life. And so he says, you must continue to walk. The, the danger zone for us is when we stop. When we stop. When we stop connecting with him. And we're just talking at him. Wah, 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 wah. And we call that prayer. But yet we're dying inside. Why? Because we're not walking with him. Or we're doing. We're, 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 we're into children's ministry every week when we're, we're saying hello to people and we're getting here early to do coffee and all that every single week and we die on the vine when we do all of those things outside of that relationship with him we're no longer walking with him and the beautiful thing about it too is is Jesus Christ never tells you to do something that he himself wouldn't lead you into it he leads Jesus Christ would never tell you to do anything that he himself has not already done so he didn't tell you just to kind of go go He says, walk with me, follow me. It's about that continuous movement. So let your roots go down into him and let your lives be built on him. Your entire life, not just part of your life, not just your Sunday life, your whole life, your vocation, where you work, your hobbies, all of those things that when you begin to leverage your entire life to build a relationship with, with Jesus Christ, by which through those things you learn from him, you begin to mature. And not only that, but begin to enjoy the life that God meant for you to enjoy, which ultimately you will find your joy not in those things, but doing life with Jesus Christ and doing it with him. And so then when we do those things, your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught 
and you will overflow with thanksgiving, thankfulness. In other words, Paul kind of gives this challenge here. If you continue to walk with Jesus Christ and learn from him and do life with him through every single part of your life, you will at the end of the day be so thankful for that. And I get it. Sometimes we, we have this false sense of what that means. And we think, well, walking with Jesus probably sounds like I'm going to become a missionary or he's going to make me do weird things or he's going to make me go do that stuff. And I don't know whether I'm ready to do that stuff. And I don't know if I want to do those things. So that way I'm not going to do anything. What Paul is agonizing over is if people would just go for a walk with Jesus Christ and begin to put their roots not into a church or into doing, but into him, then they will begin to understand who Jesus is, what he's about, and what life is all about, by which there will become this sense of thankfulness. But it has to come with a walk. And then he goes on and says, but here's the deal. Let's go back here because this happens. It happens to all of us, so let's reiterate this. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. Christ is your answers. The more that we tend to try to go into ourselves, you know what, I'm going to try to figure out my life. I've been on this planet for 46 years. I feel like the more I try to figure out my life, the more out of control my life seems to be. The more I lean into Jesus Christ and say, teach me. I want to know you. Help me to understand what life is all about. And I will go and do what you desire for me to do. I find a lot greater peace in that. But don't, don't let other people be your teachers. Why? Because they're not as good as a teacher as Jesus Christ. There's nobody who knows as much as him. There's nobody who's accomplished more and experienced life than him. He's the best teacher you got. Everything else is a very poor substitute. In other words, I think what Paul is trying to get at here. Don't do that. Don't get up on your head. Don't get up on the, all everybody's head. I mean, I think about, you know, you know, our culture. We are a bunch of goldfish. We forget things that happened in the past like that. But we have a, a teacher who knows all things and he understands life and, and he lived it to the fullest and gave up his life for us. And he wants us to have a relationship with us by which to help us to gain insight about all the things that we wonder about this world and life. And we have him with us and to learn from him. He so says, for, for in Christ, in verse 9, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in the human body. So you are also, so you also are what? You're complete through your union with Christ. And so the idea that Paul kind of gives again is your completeness is through the union of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's all aspects of it, but particularly we're talking about just your mental aspect of it. That when we are in union, we're learning from him, we begin to see more clearly the way that us as human beings were always meant to see and to see clearly. So a couple of things that I want us to end with here on the flip side of your outline, if you got it here, or you can jot these down if you didn't pick it up, but these might be a little bit helpful for you. And this is the first thing that we kind of take away from all of this. The journey of life, if you want to think differently, think this way, because this is the way that Jesus thinks. The journey of life is really the journey to know Jesus Christ. The more you know him, the more you are full. The journey of life is for you really to know God. That's it. The journey of life is not to earn more money or to, to um, you know, chase after stuff of this world, whatever that may be. Really, the fullness that you ever have is really about your relationship with Jesus Christ. The more you live with him, the more you learn from him, the more your life is full. This is what, what Jesus taught himself. John 17, 3, Jesus says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The word life there is the term zoe, which means the fullness of life. Sometimes we read words like that and we think, oh, eternal life, that means we live forever. He's not talking about quantity, just quantity. He's talking about the quality of life. This is the fullness of life that will last forever. This is where life is all, finds its, finds its joy, finds the goodness of it, is this, that they know you, God. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The word know there 
is, you know, the Greek word that's used to know there. The Jews would use that as a term of sexual intercourse, to know. Now, obviously, he's not using it like that, like sexual intercourse, but he's using it as a a form of relational intimacy. That the good things of life is having a really true intimate relationship with God. But not just any God, not the God of my mind or the God of of this world or the God of what everybody else says, but what he uses the term here, the true God. The Greek that he uses there means genuine. That real life is knowing a real God who, and the genuine God and having a relationship with him and having that intimate relationship with him. That's where life really is. Now, but here's the thing. The next point here is for Jesus, knowledge is not merely intellectual, but it's absolutely relational. It's not merely intellectual, like I said. It's relational. And this is important for us to understand that Jesus Christ isn't a dead animal by which we, we uh, uh, dissect. But sometimes that's what we think. We think that Jesus is some dead dude that we just dissect to learn some self-help stuff from him. That's not all right. That's not it. He's alive. He rose from the dead, and he is living. And he's living with us and in us through those who accept that relationship with him. He is, it's not about just some intellectual exercise. It's about relational and learning from him. Jesus said this to a group of people who, who know, knew their scriptures forwards and backwards, a group called the Pharisees, and he said this, you guys, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but here, I'm gonna shock you. They don't. Reading and getting biblical knowledge does not give you eternal life, but what they do is they point the way to the one who does, who gave us this. You see? You see? Eternal life and real life is when we read scripture and it points us back to Jesus Christ and we move our hearts and our affections back to him. In fact, one of the things that have really changed in my own life when I read through scriptures, I don't read through scriptures to learn scripture. I read through scripture with my Lord and Savior and I follow him into that and say, teach me. Teach me. And this may be helpful for to you as well is that when I pray, I usually will say to him something along these lines. Lord, you know, I'm biased. Biased from some of the things of my upbringing, biased because of my own selfish and fallen nature. There are things that I I read into this that um, I think of you, but I think that are from you, but they're not. So I'm just asking, as I read from here, I want to learn from you. Who are you? Tell me, show me, because I want to know you. Not, you're not some science project for me to dissect and then be able to give some kind of presentation to. I want to know you, everything about you. I want to know why you do what you do. I want to know the thoughts that you think and why you think those things. I want to know you. And it's not just because for, for knowledge and to be able to go do stuff. It's because I really want to know you. That's where life lies. Jesus also meets your two needs for growth, acceptance and learning. You ever been in an environment of, of, of learning by which you didn't feel very accepted? You felt like you were you're an idiot, you weren't very smart, that you, you, know, you were kind of ashamed? Jesus isn't that way. He loves you. He already knows we're all immature. doesn't shock him. Oh, they're, they're immature. I didn't know that. He knows that. But I love them, and I want them to grow to the fullness of life, so I will teach them. The best place of growth is when you're in a relationship with somebody that you feel the freedom to be able to ask questions, process hard things, even when you're not feeling it and don't know what to do and confused, but you're accepted by somebody who can lead you through that, and his name is Jesus Christ. The biggest area that keeps us from growing when it comes to learning is this area of of religion and perfectionism. Religion and perfectionism does not help you to grow. It stunts your growth. And not only that, but it creates within us all all sorts of ugly immaturity, pride, ego, uh, fear, doubt, shame. Those are really horrible places that doesn't come from Jesus Christ. That's a myth if you believe in that. The reality and the truth is that Jesus Christ is a good teacher who accepts you right where you are and wants you to learn from him because he wants you to to, um, be intimate and have a relationship with him by which all the fullness of life comes out of that. 
John 1, 14 says this, the, Lord, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of love, unconditional love, which is grace and truth. It's a beautiful thing. Oftentimes, truth is not our enemy. It's usually the delivery system of truth, right? We tend to accept truth a lot more when it comes from somebody who loves us. And that is true of Jesus Christ. And lastly, just to reiterate this and make this really firm in our hearts. If, if you desire to grow, if you desire to become complete and full, then do this. Leverage your entire life, everything about your life, fears, hurts, worries, dreams, uh, vacations, uh, work, all of it. You name it, all of it. You leverage all of it to learn from Jesus Christ. Everything that you do, you get up tomorrow morning on, on Monday morning and say, okay, Jesus, teach me today. Through the things that are going to happen today at work and happen today with my family, whatever, and I'm going to listen to you even through the things that come at me that I didn't even see coming today. I will use it all and leverage it all to learn from you. And not only that, but even more importantly, is to do life with you. In Romans 12, 2, Paul wrote another letter to a group of Christians in Rome. And he said this. He says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world i.e., if you do, through this whole message, if I can connect the dots, if you do, you'll continue to stay immature. Immature in, in the way that you handle things emotionally, the way that you handle things relationally, in the way that you see life and understand life and understand God and your relationship with him. If you do that, that's what's going to keep happening. But, he says, but let God, let God, let God, give him the opportunity in your life Open up some space in your heart and your mind for him. Let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way that you think. Again, it's not about you changing your way to how you think. Let God do and continue to do the work in, in your life through that, through a relationship through that. Because Paul, again, in a different way, in a different letter, basically says this. If you let him do that, then... This is what will happen to you. You will learn to know what God's will for you. God, what's your will for me? Well, first, the answer to that is, God, teach me. Teach me who you are and why I should do life with you and what my life is all about. More so than I'm just in a jam, so what's your will? So what do I need to do now in order to get it done and then I can go on with my life? That's not God's will for you. Do you know what God's will for you is? Christ himself to follow him and walk with him continuously, to enjoy him and to learn from him through leveraging all aspects of your life. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. If you give him a shot, sometimes it's hard. I get it. I think God's will must be horrible for my life because this really hurts. I don't know whether I really want to dive in that deep because it, it feels like it's going to hurt. Let me encourage you. He loves you. And he wants to do the work in you and for you if you submit to him. Rather than trying to figure it out all your own. And you'll grow ever closer to him. And you'll gain insight. And over time, I, I believe this. I've seen it in my own life. And I'm not arrived there either. I'm still very immature in my ways, and I'm still growing as well. But the more I know Jesus Christ, the more I trust him, the more I, be, I realize that he really does know what he's talking about. He's a pretty smart dude. He's really a genius. He has this thing figured out pretty well, a lot better than I do. And his will and the ways that he does things, it really is good and pleasing and perfect. And the things that I had in, in, in the, and the reasons why I didn't think so in the past was because I believed all sorts of wrong things. I did not have the thoughts of Christ. I had the thoughts of man and thoughts of Tyler. But the more I give that over to him, the more I begin to realize he really does know what he's doing. And I think about what Mitch said earlier about, um, you know, the willies and, and the matoses and all the things that they're, they're giving up and sacrificing and doing, the hard work that they're doing down in the Dominican Republic. I think of John uh, particularly. Uh, you know, when 
not if, but when you buy your tickets for uh, Latin dinner night, you need to go and you need to ask this guy, tell me your story. You know, it was only not too long ago when if somebody would have said to him, hey, here's God's will for you. It's, you, it's for you to, to um, quit this, this very wonderful, lucrative job at Universal, which is kind of fun and exciting. And I want you to go to a really poor place, leave all that stuff behind. And I want you to go and hang out with a bunch of poor people who are uh, dealing with a lot of hard issues. And you're gonna have to go into that dealing with all those hard issues. I guarantee you, knowing John back in those days, he would have thought you were nuts. Not only that, he would have thought you were stupid. He may have even called you a name, but there's no way in the world he was gonna do that. But over time, as he met Jesus Christ and relationally, truly accept him into his own life and doing life with him and learning from him, over time, he began to realize, you know, maybe the greater ride of life isn't just going and providing millions and millions of dollars of epic rides at Universal. Maybe the greatest epic ride is this ride of just going, okay, Lord, I wanna learn from you. I'll go wherever you want, teach me. It wasn't something that just happened over time. It was steps, slow steps, sometimes maybe a little catalytic steps, but steps by which he began to see, oh, you're good. You don't want to mess up my life. You actually want me to have a great life. I'm beginning to see it. I'm trusting you more. Teach me more. I want to do life with you more. And as we come into this time of communion, it's the same thing. If you have these thoughts of Jesus, that Jesus wants to make your life miserable, he doesn't. He didn't give up and sacrifice his life for you to make your life miserable. He came to give you life, life in the fullest. And life in the fullest is always done through a relationship with him. And as you take the, the bread and the cup, the juice, that symbolizes his love for you, I want you to hold on to that. Not as a mental construct, but within your heart. Reach out to him through your heart. Don't do, do a religious exercise, because it doesn't mean jack. Come to it and just say, you who love me, teach me. You may even come and say, I don't know whether you really love me or not. I don't even know whether you exist or not, but I'm willing to give you a shot. I'm willing to let you in to teach me and to see if you are real or if your will is good and pleasing and perfect. I don't mind giving you that challenge because I, I know what, what's gonna happen to that. You're gonna be thankful and you're gonna see that he is good and that he loves you. We'll also have people here at the corners for, to pray for you. Um, it's important for us to talk to God together and to do that together and to do that relationally, not just because we have problems or issues, and that's fine, we can talk about those things, but sometimes it's good just to come up to somebody and just say, hey, let's just talk together to our Lord. So whatever you have, whatever's going on in your mind, you want just to pray and talk with somebody, we'll have them at, at the cross. Let me pray. Father, you know me well. You know how I can be sometimes emotionally immature, relationally immature. Um, I can be immature spiritually, all of those things. I thank you first and foremost that you accept me even in that immaturity. I'm also thankful that you just didn't leave me alone to be stuck where I'm at as a child and being childish. I'm thankful that you are learning and you're teaching me in my relationship with you. And I see that my life is growing. And I continue to look forward to how you're going to grow me even more. I thank you that you've given us all the opportunity to go on this journey, that we can release this idea of perfectionism and religion and just know you and learn from you and begin to see life through your lens, to see more clearly. It's in your son's name I pray.